When I was ten, my mother, having sold her old fox fur, a ginger red bone jawed magdalupescu of a fox that on her arm played dead, cunningly dangled a lean and tufted paw, decided there was money to be made from foxes and bought via the columns of the Courier Mail a whole pack of them. They hung from penny hooks in our panelled sitting room, trailed from the backs of chairs, and Brisbane ladies, rather the worse for war, drove up in taxis wearing a GI on their arm and rang at our front door. I slept across the hall, at night hearing their thin cry. I dreamed the dangerous spark of their eyes, brushes of flame in our fur-hung nomadic tent in the suburbs, the dark fox stink of them, cornered in their holes and turning. Among my mother's showpieces, Noritake teacups, tall hock glasses with stems like barley sugar, gold leaf demitas, the foxes, row upon row, thin-nosed, prick-eared, dead. The cry of hounds was lost behind mirror glass, where ladies with silken snoods and fingernails of Chinese lacquer red fastened a limp paw, went down in their high heels to the warm, soft bitumen, wearing at throat and elbow the rare spoils of 44. Old foxes, rusty red, like dried up wounds, and a GI escort. <laughs> Uh, I left Brisbane when I was 24 and went to England for 10 years, uh, where I taught. And this is a poem about teaching, but it's also about something which, of course, I didn't know about. I grew up in a place where I had no experience whatsoever of the phenomenon of snow. And it's not just snow and what it looks like and what it falls like. It's something else which the poem is about. It's called Snow in the classroom. A stirring as among cattle that lift their heads through darkness to the scent of water. Horses snuffing at thunder in the grass. And nothing today will keep them quiet or still in the pinewood desks or summon their eyes to reflect figures and cold facts from the blackboard. They brim with light, a window square, where trees writhe, sky grows greenish bronze and staggers white like surf. Their senses catch it from far off. Something moves towards them, edging closer even than lead pencils. Cats, chalk, or the salty creases in clothes. An excitement whose crystals fall through their veins, the spaces of their skull, wavering towards them, Animal eyes, the nostrils flared, like the feathers of owls, angel sky flakes, blessing the dull cobbles and slant black roofs, bare playground, pond. On their hands, the taste of stars, a foreign coldness, color of distances and all that is further off than flesh. Falling light strikes upward. Its brightness creaks under our shoes. So, is, is the sound still okay? Can you hear it out there? Yeah, okay. It's just that it slightly changed in my ears, so I, uh, I thought it might have gone. Look, this is a poem uh, that goes back to school days. I, I, I was just going to say something about the business of poetry especially, which harks back in some kind of way. Uh, it's, it's got nothing to do with nostalgia. It's really always about catching up at last with some experience in the past that you're ready to sort of see at last and feel. And so this is a, this is a poem, it's called Episode from an Early War, uh, and it goes back again to the period of the last thing. I just point out two small facts in this. 
Uh, there's a reference later, really, to children in the, in the Atlantic. One of the sort of most astonishing moments of my life was the moment when I realised, and it was from a news thing, something I heard on the news, and that is that a ship taking refugee children from England to Canada, was called the Benares, had been sunk and about 700 children had been drowned. And there was a very, very famous moment. Um, uh, Thomas Mann's daughter was on that boat with her husband and he was drowned. And um, a man called Georg Kaiser, a German playwright, wrote a play about that. Um, but for me, it was the sort of moment when I first realized something absolutely terrifying, which was that as a child, there would be circumstances where your parents could not protect you. And uh, there's a kind of reference to that later in the poem. <clears throat> this is the, it's called Episode from an Early War. Sometimes, looking back, I find myself, a bookish nine-year-old, still gazing down through the wartime crisscross shockproof glass of my suburban primary school. <clears throat> Blue flint gravel ripples in my head the schoolyard throbs, and all the players of rip shirt, rough and tumble war games stop, look on in stunned surprise. Hector, hero of Troy, rare bloody boned, is dragged across the scene and pissed on and defiled, while myrmidons of black flies crust his wounds, and the angelic, blunt faced ones, the lords of mutilation fall off and watch. My way home that Friday, like any other afternoon, was the same familiar crossing of three streets, past a shop that sold nigger chews and bull's, bull's eyes, the fig tree gloom of Musgrave Park, where metho drinkers slept in a buzz and flammable haze, their red-eyed flame in foxhole nightmare, the scraping of a match. I knew then that the war, our war, was real. Highways of ash, where ghostly millions rise out of their shoes and go barefoot nowhere. The children herded into vans for their journey. Or where white, or white world spick and span bathhouses suddenly trapped by their craving for breath. At night, Fog-bound in mid-Atlantic, my still sleep was choked with bodies. Blind kittens in the tub where Mrs. Allen did our wash still jerked at arm's distance, kicking their life out in a sack. Immaculate, stiff with starch, my shirts after that creaked, their collars scratched. Our days were green, matter-of-fact, happy. Only at night, far out in the shipping lanes, I found it. White fog thickened in my chest. <laughs> Just watch it. Time. Um, this poem's called Decades End. It's the end of the 60s. I came back to Australia in 1968 and was really looking back at that whole decade that has passed, as, as one does. Uh, there's reference here to something some people may remember, which is the Cuba crisis in 1962. Decades end. Stock taking. What have I put away out of these seven fat years to be used against the seven lean? Postcards of travel, slow Rhine barges towing cathedrals through fog. Towards dawn, the Aegean breaking dolphin backed with islands. Twice in a cool decade, love that rings us dry, wrung me dry. I survived, as we all did, Cuba's nine day hiss and splutter. Like straw men caught with a matchbox in the wind, we kindled at a spark. We were dry sticks and newsprint pouring out smuts. 
And I dreamed of the hornet's nest my father burned. Black earwax dripped, the wingless stumbling from Troy. We burn, but so slowly consuming our fats that we barely feel it, candles trembling and swaying. Feeding the body's flame, we glow, we fade. Not all of us, even in seven years, can be renewed. But the light, at least, is something to read by, till we learn to do without it, growing accustomed to the dark. And I just want to uh, read a couple of poems from Earth Hour. Um, first of all, another one of those poems about looking back and trying to come to terms with the unfinished business of the past. Uh, this one's called Retrospect, and I'm one of the characters in it. The other character in it is uh, a character who, like in a no my first novel called Jono, and the poem is called Retrospect. A day at the end of winter, two young men hooded against the silvery, thin rain that lights the forest boughs are making towards a town that at this distance never gets closer. One of them, not me, as he turns, impatient for the other to catch up, wears even now when I meet his face in dreams, the look of one already gone, already gone too far into the forest. As when, last night in sleep, I looked behind me out of the queue for an old movie, and you were there, hood thrown back, your stack of dirty blonde hair, misted with sky rack. And when my heart leapt to meet to greet you, Know you gl your glance in the old conspiratorial way insisted. Don't speak, don't recognize me. So I did not turn again, but followed down the track to where all those years back you turned and waited. And we went on together at the bare end of winter, breath from our mouths still clouding the damp air, our footsteps loud on the sunlit cobbled street down into Sevres. Um, this is the poem that um, gives its name to Earth Hour. I'm sure you all know what Earth Hour is. It's a reference to that. Earth Hour. <clears throat> it is on our hands it is in our mouths at every breath. How not remember? Called back to nights when we were wildlife, before kindling or kine, we sit behind moonlit glass in our McMansions, cool millions at rehearsal here for our rendezvous, each with his own earth hour. We are feral at heart, unhouseled creatures, Mind is the maker, mad for light, for enlightenment. This late admission of darkness, the cost, and the silence on our tongue as we count the hour down, the coin we bring, long hoarded, just for this, the extended cry of our first coming to this ambulant, airy, Schatzkammer and midden, our green accommodating tomb. Uh, and finally, finally, a poem from my second last book, Typewriter Music. Um, it's, a, it's an attempt to translate a very, very short 17 word poem in Latin that just about every person who has ever written poetry in English has tried to translate. Um, I looked at it and decided that the problem with it is that the poem is so densely layered 
um, that you could only attempt to really translate it by doing it several times. So I've produced seven translations of this little line. The, the line. It, it's an address um, supposed to be by the Emperor Hadrian uh, to his soul. So it's one of those poems in which the, uh, the body uh, addresses the departing soul. And of course, you know, there's a whole line of Christian poems about that, but this is a pagan poem about that. And uh, it's also in its own kind of way a love poem. And so I'll read, first of all, uh, the Latin, and then um, read my attempt to render this very, very simple poem by doing it seven times over so that we'll, we finally get all the possible meanings. <clears throat> so it's, I called it Seven Last Words of the Emperor Hadrian, which is itself a kind of joke. And I'll read it first of all in Latin. I, I just what I would also say about it, the Latin is made up almost entirely of uh, dimin diminutives and their pet words. And, you know, these words aren't... You, you can't use diminutives in English, so we'd have to find some other way of doing that. But you can hear that they're diminutives because the same little um, ending recurs. This is the poem. Animula, bagula, blandula, hospes camosques corporis, quae nunc abibis in loca, pallidula, rigida, nudula, nec ut soles dabis jocos. And so these are the seven versions. <clears throat> Dear soul mate, little guest and companion, what shift will you make now out there in the cold? If this is a joke, it is old, old. Soul, small wandering one, my lifelong companion, where will you go, numb, pale, undefended? Now the joke we shared is ended. Little lightfoot spirit, housemate, bedfellow, where are you off to now? Cat got your tongue, lost your shirt, caught your death? Well, the last laugh is on you, is on us. Sweet urchin, Fly by night, heart's guest, my better half and solace. You've really done it this time. You've played one trick too many. Fool, you've laughed us both out of breath. If this is one of your jokes, my Jack, my Jack in the box, lay off. Where have you got to? It's cold out there. And what will you do without me, you sweet idiot? Go naked, houseless? Come back to bed. <laughs> What's this, old mouse, my secret sharer? Gone where? Did you think I'd let you slip away without me after a lifetime of happy scrapes? Who warmed you, clothed you, fed you, paid with laughter for your tricks, your japes? Is this the one joke for Jack Penates? For Jack Penates, dear bugaboo, your emperor does not get... So you're playing fast and loose, are you? You've cut the love knot. Well, let's see how you get on out there without me. Who's kidding who? Without my body, its royal breath and blood to warm you, my hands, my tongue, to prove to you what's real, what's not, poor fool, you're nothing. But, out, but oh, without you, my sweet nothing, I'm dust. Thank you. Thank you.